Hi, it's Paul from Wicked Acorn. We're walking alongside the Bridgewater Canal today. It's a beautiful day and we're headed towards Sale in Greater Manchester. No doubt you've seen these things before. They're cranes. It's just an old crane. But what are they for? Let's go take a look. For over two and a half centuries, we've been enjoying the benefits of the Bridgewater Canal. But it didn't always look like this. You wouldn't see canoes and kayaks. This was a working canal. This was the land of coal and cotton. There were no beautiful boats like these. Instead, you would see narrow boats loaded down with coal to keep the wheels of the Industrial Revolution turning. But there's not much left to see of that these days. That's why we're here today. I want to find out what this thing is. They called it the Duke's Cut, but the canal was built by men like these, the navvies. It was the idea of this man, Francis Edgerton, third Duke of Bridgewater. He needed a better way to get his coal from his mines in Worsley to Manchester, a distance of some 10 miles. And at the age of just 23, he brought his first bill before Parliament. He promised to lower the price of coal to no more than four pence per hundredweight. Within its first year of opening, the Duke's cut had cut the cost of coal by more than half. Initially, his agent John Gilbert was involved in the preliminary leveling and surveying of the site. James Brindley proposed a change in the route which would require the building of a stone aqueduct across the Irwell, thereby joining Trafford Park and Stretford to Manchester. This required a change to the bill before Parliament. Brindley was able to appease any doubters in the Parliamentary Committee by demonstrating his ideas for the Barton Aqueduct by making a model from cheese. The Barton Aqueduct was an engineering feat ridiculed by many, but it was the crowning success of the opening of the canal on the 17th of July, 1761. The Bridgewater Canal has a special place in history, as it was the first canal in Britain to be built without following an existing water course, and so became a model for those that followed it. At 39 miles long, it is considered to be the first true canal in England. Built all on one level, its route followed the contours of the land to avoid the use of locks. So, what's all this got to do with cranes? Well, you remember there are no locks on the Bridgewater Canal. There's enough water in the Bridgewater Canal to fill a football pitch to nearly the height of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. The water at Worsley is the same height above sea level as the water at Manchester and the same all the way out to Runcorn. And that means if you poke a hole in it anywhere, it all drains out. The Bridgewater Canal had become one of the most important lifelines in the country. The loss of water was always of great concern to canal builders and those that used them. From the very beginning, they employed lengthsmen. They were responsible for lengths of towpath and the canal along it. They would monitor water levels and were responsible for the repair and maintenance of banks on their length. The powers that be were always worried that the Germans would use the canals to invade the country. They could have used the canal to move troops and arms inland. But in fact, the German Luftwaffe had quite detailed target maps 
and they put the canals in very distinctly. Still water at night reflects even the smallest amount of light, which made the canals a very good source for navigation. They had to have wanted to bomb them. The canal was a vital transport link between Trafford Park, Manchester and Runcorn, and then to the Liverpool docks. But using them for guidance must have outweighed this. No doubt, they used the canal as a guide to Altrincham, which was bombed several times during the war. The RAF had one of its biggest munition sites there, as well as fuel reserves. If the canal suffered a direct hit, stop planks would be swung into position by a crane. This would prevent the canal from being drained along its entire length. Cranes and planks were situated around every two miles along the canal. These relatively short stretches could be isolated to facilitate the repair of the canal banks without too much disruption to this vital transport link. So here's how it works. We made a little mock-up of the Bridgewater Canal in our garden. You can see our little stop plank crane and the brick represents our stop planks. Canal boats loaded with coal, of course. Floating freely, everything is ship shape and Bristol fashion. But oh no, there's been a breach. Immediately, the lengthsman springs into action and brings to ready the stop planks. Men with spring lines would help position it and drop it in place into these slots in the side of the canal. Now one section is isolated from the other. The water is still draining out of the breach, but all the water on the other side of the stop planks has been saved. I haven't been able to find any information on how long it took to fill up the Bridgewater Canal. It must have taken months and months. I believe it's only filled naturally from the runoff from the mines at Worsley. Here you can see the muck and things on the bottom of our little canal. Just imagine what's on the bottom of our real canal. There can't be anything better than a walk alongside the Bridgewater Canal. It's one of the most beautiful places in Manchester. And we do a pretty good job of keeping it clean and tidy. But if ever there was a breach, and the canal was drained. This is what awaits us at the bottom of the canal. A stinky, tangled mess. This actually happened in 2005. Boaters moored on the canal noticed the water level dropping. They contacted the Manchester Ship Canal Company. Eight miles of canal in Manchester completely drained. The problem was caused by the failure of a wooden sluice gate at Castlefield. I spoke with Liam of Canal World and he had this to say about it. Unfortunately, a lot of the stop planks and cranes are in a state of disrepair and the only one functioning at the time was the one in sale which meant that the section between Sale and Castlefield was drained. 
It was amazing to see the build-up of things on the canal bed. You could clearly see what would normally lurk under the water. Shopping trolleys, road cones, motorbikes, tires, washing machines, bricks, the lot. How we managed to get our boats along is quite a shock. Even though the stop planks were dropped into place in sail, the amount of rubbish on the canal bed meant that a proper seal couldn't be achieved. It did hold back some water, but it was still draining. The stop planks in Broad Heath were also deployed, which did the job. I was at work at the time. I received a text about the water levels dropping rapidly, and so went straight over after I'd finished. At the time, the two maintenance team guys were preparing the crane, and I was roped in to help along with my dad. We had to precariously stand on the planks whilst they were in place. We had to jump up and down in order for them to bed in. Rather exciting stuff. The stop planks hadn't been used for God knows how long. They just weren't doing their job. They had to be secured by a coping stone which sat on the planks very precariously. The old wooden sluice was beyond saving, and so the canal company dropped several bulk bags of aggregate over the hole in order to block it, and work continues on the sluice even today to finish off its replacement. Everybody loves a little picturesque urban decay, but this piece of machinery is part of a canal that's still operating. I think we need a few new planks and a shot of grease, and while we're at it, why don't we give it a lick of paint? If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, or head on over to our webpage, wickedacorn.com, where you can purchase all kinds of Manchester-themed things.